The British Army is one of the world's most experienced fighting forces. From Blenheim to Waterloo, from Balaclava to the Somme, it has played its part in history's most bloody conflicts. But as it's executed Herculean tasks in the world's toughest terrains, what were these troops wearing? How did epaulettes and sashes, pantaloons and Wellington boots end up clothing British troops on the battlefield? Sometimes primitive, sometimes protective, sometimes downright extravagant. Over the years, military clothing has both enabled and inhibited objectives. The uniforms we see today is the result of 400 years of spectacular trial and error. We're here at the National Army Museum stores. It's a top secret location just north of London, and it is a treasure trove and Aladdin's cave of military hardware. There's trucks, there's cannons, there's guns, and there's even parts of the Berlin Wall. But what I'm here to see today is the astonishing collection of military uniforms. This is the story of the uniform of the British Army. Hi Sophie, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? Not too bad, thank you so much for getting together this amazing collection for us. So excited to see it today. So what I've done is I've got out a selection of uniforms to kind of look at the development and how they change over time, starting with one of the earliest things we have. 1640s, leather jerkin worn by a light cavalryman or harquebusier. Really, really amazing thick leather, would have been really good at stopping sword cuts, uh, much lighter than armour, but you could wear a back and breastplate with it. One of the things that came in in the Civil War was uh, scarves or sashes, because some could actually be up to nine foot long, uh, and that was to try and really help you work out who was on your side and who wasn't. Because obviously on a really busy battlefield, you need some kind of idea of who is who and, and who you're supposed to be fighting. And so why are we starting at the Civil War? What was, were people not wearing uniforms before then? Or? No, so you don't really have uniform before then. You do have liveries, people wearing uh, clothes to denote what household they are fighting alongside or with. You also find people uh, putting leaves and things onto their hats and jackets to denote kind of who they are, but obviously not very good, which is why scarves are really important. And that is really the beginning of uh, kind of uniform coming in or having some kind of recognition. So what is it made of exactly? So it's made of leather. Okay. Uh, it would have originally have had leather sleeves, um, but a much more softer, pliable leather. And you okay. can see some of the, the stitch holes from where they would have been in place. Okay. And the other thing uh, that kind of gives us an idea of how expensive uh, and, uh, and well made it is, is you can, it's kind of got remnants of metallic thread. You could wear it underneath armour, you could wear it with a back and breastplate, um, but it could be worn on its own. Um, obviously armour is much better at stopping sword slashes and people trying to get at you with their pike, but this would also do a good job. And also, because as a light cavalryman, he would have been on a horse as well, so he's higher up um, and off the ground. Okay, great. Well, that's a good start. Now we're moving on here. We're jumping a bit in time to this one, isn't it? Yes, it's a, a bit of a jump. This one dates to 1773. Okay. Um, but just to give you a little fill in for the gaps that we have, when it's the restoration in 1660, uh, the standing army is created and a lot of regiments are disbanded and some are kept. Um, but it's only the horse and foot guards. So this is an example of uh, the first regiment of foot guards. It's an other ranks coat. Uh, so it would be a lot less flashy than the officers. Uh, lace is a really, really big feature of uh, clothing kind of around this time. You see it's got a longer, wider skirt on the coat. I kind of think it probably wasn't the most helpful for marching in. Uh, it was kind of get in the <laughs> way or for fighting. Do we have any reports of what people thought about wearing this kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it's jumping forward ever so slightly, but there's a, a brilliant uh, open letter to an editor of the Time Mercury in 1806 of a guy who writes in complaining about how extravagant uniforms are and how difficult uh, certain aspects of them are. And my favourite part of it, he says, can we not fight without dying in tinsel <laughs> because of all of these extra... <laughs> Why were the British Army wearing bright red on the battlefield? So red is obviously a really, really visible colour and at a time when the battlefield is really smoky, you need to be able to stand out because you've got to be able to know who is who. You don't want to be shooting your friend rather than your enemy. But also, this material at that point in time is cheap. So it's not picked, as some people believe, to hide the blood, but just because it is a cheap material to buy in bulk to be dressing your soldiers with. And the other important thing to mention about this as well is facings. 
Um, so these come in and they're a really, really important way of differentiating between different regiments. Um, so facings would usually be found on the collar, the lapels at this point in time, and the cuffs. And that colour would tell you what regiment they belong to. And it's also a really important uh, way of distinguishing who is who. So when you have loads of different red coats, you need a way of distinguishing between all of that red and working out who is who. And that's where we see things like the buttons and epaulettes. Again, it's something that is stipulated in the different warrants that you, uh, that you have. So who is it exactly who's making these decisions and what, what kind of events are propelling these decisions? Is it a kind of bottom-up, um, you know, soldiers at the bottom complaining about getting too wet and their boots not working? Or is it the generals at the top, um, you know, deciding I want my men to look smarter? It is very much top-down. Yeah, as always. <laughs> yes. Dress regulations come in in 1822 under the reign of George IV who is uh, very well known for his love of clothes, his <laughs> love of fashion. But yeah, no, here we have uh, an infantry uh, short-tailed coatie, which dates uh, to... A coatie. Now, what is a coat yes. versus a coatie? <laughs> We've been looking at a coat, yes. and this is a coatie. So it's got a higher waist, and you can see that he has short tails which kind of go over and cover his bum at the back, uh, which is much different from the design we've got here. Um, and it's probably to you know, make it more helpful with marching because they did also actually start to turn back the flaps of their coats. Um, and so this is 1811, this one? Yes, this okay. is 1811. So this is peak Napoleonic. Yes, kind of Peninsula time. Wars. And, uh, and again, you can see the, uh, the facing colours here are very, very prominent across the chest and the collar uh, and on his cuffs. Okay, and tell me about these buttons. Number 77, is that the regiment? It is, yes. It's the 77th East Middlesex Regiment of Foot. Okay. And were these uniforms visible in civilian society? You know, I'm thinking about Jane Austen when she's writing in this kind of period, and it's always uh, Lydia Bennett saying, you know, the officers are coming to Merriton, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And they go to these balls and these dinners, and they're always in regimental dress. They are. It was the first thing my mind jumped to when you said about that because uh, <laughs> Jane Austen writes uh, quite a lot about uh, the army, the militia, yeah. when, like you said, when they come to Meryton um, and there's a line about them dazzling in scarlet. As Lydia Bennett quite rightly said. <laughs> <laughs> As the Battle of Waterloo drew the curtains on the Napoleonic Wars, the British army were free to expand their ambitions further afield. The 19th century saw the steady consolidation of the British Empire Equipped with the latest weapons, transport and equipment forged by the Industrial Revolution, the first major test of victorious troops came at the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853. This is possibly yes. the most um, sumptuous along here. And what a tiny waist! A tiny, tiny waist. Absolutely miniature. So this is also a coatie. You can see we've kind of still kept that, still got the high waist. So we've also got some legwear that would go with this short tail coatie, if oh, you would like. To some see bottom them. halves, how exciting! <laughs> so, uh, so these are pantaloons. We've got this really lovely applique here. As you can see, they are very tight fitting. Uh, there would have been little uh, room in them. There's no pockets, and they would have been worn with boots. And you can see the lines on them here. Oh, yeah, that's uh, right. Which I think is where the boots would have come to. I see they would really, really uh, be a very, very tight fit on you. A bit like skinny jeans or leggings today, I think. Showing off um, your calves. Yeah. <laughs> so what's interesting is um, we've also got a pair of breeches here as well. Oh. Um, so so what is the difference between breeches and pantaloons? <laughs> So as you can see, these are longer, much tighter, mm. and these would actually finish uh, around your knee um, and would be worn with kind of stockings, gaiters, slightly different uh, to these. But again, no pockets um, and uh, a bit of a, a different fit. Um, is it a bit more baggy, these ones? Yeah, and then they kind of come in. You get quite a bum on them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I can see the detail here, the, the seven on the buttons. Mm. Is that the regiment number? Yeah, again? linking into the regiment, yeah. Um, and what's interesting is um, there's a lot of similarity uh, with this period still um, between the army and civilian fashion. Uh, so Beau Brummel, uh, whose name is a byword for you know fashion and a dandy. Uh, yes, That's a dandy. It, yeah. Supposedly he kind of was uh, one of the reasons that pantaloons came into being because he wanted like a nice clean fit and it to be really nice and slick. So what came first, civilian clothing or the military clothing, or was it a chicken and egg situation? It's very much a chicken and egg situation between military clothing and civilian fashion. You see a lot of zigzagging, really, from the very, very early days. 
this is the Buffs Regiment, which is a nickname that they got from their facings. So we said a little bit about facings before. Um, a lot of regiments would get a nickname for them and some would uh, end up getting a title from them. Um, the buff. The buff. So why yeah. is that? So this is because of uh, the colour of the facings here. So this is, it is called oh, buff. Oh, I see. That colour. Kind of um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And can you tell me about these buttons as well? So you've got the yes, of symbol course. of the dragon, I think, mm. and there's some sort of Latin motto. Yeah, <laughs> so these are the regimental buttons uh, for the buffs regiment. And then also has a, a Prussian collar with tight wow. fits up here. And how and would that have affected fighting on a battlefield? I can't think of anything worse than having I know, that. being very restricted. I think yeah. it's something that you kind of see in these. You kind of think, would I be able to fight <laughs> in that? Would it be restrictive? How much movement have you got? But there was something else in the clothing warrants from the 1760s as well, which was saying about how it needed to be tight, but not enough that it would cause restraint. So you could fight in it, but you needed to still kind of look good and look the part. And this was from the Crimean War, is that right? And we actually yes. know exactly who the person was. Yes, it's a Captain John Lewis of the Buffs Regiment, and he went out to the Crimea in 1855, right in the middle of it. But it's interesting because 1855 is also a really key date for moving from coaties to tunics. Yeah, the Crimea seems like they had a lot of things which went quite badly wrong, which provoked quite a lot of big changes. I'm thinking about Florence Nightingale and the Scutari barracks, which mm -hmm. apparently were covered in about an inch of faeces when Florence Nightingale got there. And that sort of changed what we thought about hospitals. And I, it's interesting that they also changed the uniforms at the same mm. time because of that. And this is what we came up with, the tunic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this tunic dates to 1856, so okay. literally uh, cusp of the, the Crimean War and the tunic coming in. Uh, and it's in other ranks, uh, Katie. You can see we've got cloth epaulets, um, much more practical maybe compared to mm. those. It's still red, still red. That's one of the, the key yeah. things here. OK, so post Crimea now, how is warfare and warfare technology changing? So firearms are starting to change. Around 1880, uh, we start to see uh, breech loading firearms coming in as opposed to muzzle loading. And I've got some examples oh, that I great. can show you. OK, we'll pass you the fun. Great. So here, <laughs> yeah. you see, uh, we have a flintlock musket. Uh, you can see it's got GR on, the Georgian. Um, so this one Ugh. would have to be loaded up here. So this is a muzzle loading firearm. Okay. So you would stick your powder and your shot in here, ram it down, and then you'd be able to fire it. Um, but you standing up, you, um, you want to be able to see what you're aiming for because the accuracy of these isn't amazingly All great. All over the place. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and then, right. so when we have this change, we move to this. So this is a bolt action rifle. I, think, believe, I believe this one is an Enfield. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, this is breech loading. So you can okay. see here where we have the bolt just here. You would pull that back, put your shot in there, and then you'd be able to... Uh, to fire it, but you can do all of that from lying down or hiding or taking cover. Okay. Um, and, and it really changes the way in which uh, the, the battlefield is used. The disasters of the Crimean War provoked a series of investigations and reports to recommend changes to the British Army's organisation. In 1868, William Gladstone's Liberal government began a process of modernisation. They set out to centralise the power of the War Office, create reserve forces stationed in Britain and establish short terms of service for enlisted men. The army was engaging in conflicts spanning the globe, from India to Burma, Egypt to Afghanistan. And one of the greatest tests for Victoria's army was the Anglo-Boer Wars. So with the Boer War, uh, the first one in uh, 1880 to 81, uh, soldiers that are arriving from India to fight there are issued with khaki. Um, so khaki uh, is the Urdu word for dust um, and uh, it was potentially first uh, worn in 1846 by Lumsden's horse in India uh, and they dyed uh, their uniforms, um, I think there's like records of like tea or you know earth or to kind of give you this uh, natural protection uh, and camouflage you against the terrain that you're fighting in. Um, so uh, soldiers are issued with this when they arrive at the Boer War to fight uh, and then in 1886 uh, it becomes, uh, it's adopted for, uh, for active service. Um, and then we have the Second Boer War of 1899 to 1902 um, and again men are fighting in this, it's much better, much more camouflaged against their surroundings. 
Um, and, uh, and then in 1902 itself, uh, the British Army formally adopt a universal service dress, uh, which this is an example of. So how do you, how would they have distinguished their regiment? So there's still carryovers that we've seen from these previous bits. So you would have your uh, epaulets, obviously, for your rank, uh, collar badges. Um, again, buttons still uh, reflect the regiment. And I noticed there's, there's pockets. There suddenly. are pockets, yes. <laughs> you know, that's, it's, they haven't <laughs> put anything useful on the previous uniforms. Uh, no, yeah, pockets are such a, a huge thing. Um, and yeah, you, you don't really find them uh, on other uniforms. Sometimes there might be the odd one tucked in the little back of a coaty tail. Um, but uh, I remember reading somewhere, uh, pockets aren't necessary for soldiers who have nothing to carry in them. And did they notice any significant improvement in their success rate, you know, not having the bright red on the battlefield? I think it, it would probably help, as we said, the development of firearms um, and the way in which you can fight and the terrain that you're fighting on. Uh, it would certainly help you blend in. Around this time, uniforms then split. So you've got this that you're going to fight in, but the red coats that have been worn previously are actually kept and they are worn as full dress, you know, the ceremonial kind of things that you see people uh, or see soldiers uh, doing today, like you know, changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it very much then splits in two. Um, and we have a red coat from around this period, if you would like to try it on. Oh, I'd love to, yes. So this dates to 1910. Uh, so it's a really nice example. Of, 1910. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, That's this is more like it. So, so what would this tunic have been used for? So this tunic would be uh, your full dress, so it wouldn't be what you would wear to fight in anymore because it dates to 1910 after khaki comes in for active service. So, um, this is a bit of a hangover from the earlier ones, isn't it? They yes, it is. You see a lot of them with that pattern and it's reflected braiding. here. And I love these. These are Austrian knots um, and you see them on quite a lot of uniforms and they are absolutely beautiful. Like the, the workmanship that goes into uh, the embroidery and the applique and the things that you see on, on uniforms is incredible. So this is very much your... Uh, your nice fancy thing that you would wear for uh, special special occasions. And it's funny that they, so this is an Austrian knot and we've had a Prussian collar. Yes. Was there quite a lot of intermixing between these European yeah. uniforms? The British Army very much, if it sees an army that it admires, that it likes, um, and uniform aspects of uniform that it uh, that it also appreciates, it will um, use them. <laughs> um, so we find this very much with the hussars, like again the cavalry, but uh, we take those from the Hungarians um, and copy those, and they are absolutely beautiful uniforms. Um, but we also copy the Polish lancers as well. Um, so there are uh, definitely aspects where we uh, we see things that we really like, and of course you know the India taking the the, the khaki as well. What's this one? I can't even hardly see. <laughs> <So> you <laughs> <want> <laughs> the epaulets that you've got on your yeah. shoulders. So we've got the rank badges up there. Oh, yeah. So this one, it's got three pips. So this would have been worn by a captain. Okay. Um, and you can see the, obviously the epaulets change over time as well. And the colour as well, it's much brighter. It's, you know, it's really been revolutionised by the Industrial Revolution uh, and, and what is produced and how it can be produced. Because um, obviously factories coming in as well, you kind of start finding much more... Um, uh, things are much more mass produced, um, but officers, of course, as well, they would get their things tailored, so it would be specifically for them, uh, whereas other ranks would just get the thing that cl fitted closely enough, um, and then potentially a regimental tailor could uh, could work on it for them. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty heavy. What's What sort of material is this made of? I believe this is wool, or a lot of the earlier ones are made from wool, because you can really see a development uh, in the type of material that things are being made from so you've kind of got wools and linens and cottons and then as we move forward um, a little bit further down we have like nylon and kevlar um, so a proper proper change but that's a bit further in the future yet for this it feels quite small for mm -hmm. me <laughs> i can imagine you know some men would be much bigger is it mm. is, uh, were they particularly tight or is this a just particularly small one by I chance that one would have been tailored specifically oh, to course, yeah. the uh the officer so uh i think he must have just been so in really good shape <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay great so first world war what have we got here so this is the khaki surge obviously carrying on from service dress this is still what we're wearing uh, dates to 1916 which is the middle of the first world war this would have been worn by other ranks um you can see uh, we have pockets, this is still, uh, still a trend, um, and it buttons up to the neck, 
So officers would actually have had a different style. Theirs would be open, so you could see a tie and a shirt underneath. It's a small distinguishing uh, factor between the two of them. We don't really see too much change. Obviously, you're um, in the trench. You're wanting to blend into those muddy surroundings, um, but there are kind of innovations that come up. So trench coats really took off in popularity during the First World War when they became part of the standard kit for officers. Uh, and the other thing uh, that uh, is again repopularised during this time is the Wellington boot. Nice. Millions were commissioned for men in the trenches uh, to prevent them getting trench foot. Uh, and obviously, you know, standing in water for a huge amount of time, you need some uh, decent footwear. So it's really a time of in trying to innovate and, and work out what you need to wear to suit your, uh, your surroundings. So here we have the First World War tunic for you to try on. Great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Missed an arm. I think they had these problems in the trenches. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, it's pretty it's scratchy, this one. It's not quite yeah. as um, comfortable as the other. Yeah. Does it feel like if you got it wet, it would. Uh, yeah, it this would feels like down. if you got wet, you'd feel like it mm. would really soak you to the skin. OK, so it almost feels like a kind of tweedy material, or mm. it's just wool, is it? Or it is, yeah, they are made from wool, yeah. And what sort of things would people have kept in their pocket? I mean, in <laughs> film, in, it always seems to be pictures of their loved ones or mm. um, maybe a few cigarettes. So you definitely, like I said, have your letters, your cigarettes, that kind of thing in there. But you also have bits of kit for carrying the other things that you were expected to carry with you. You've also got other things that you could wear over it, like a cape um, and, and, and different bits. Also your hat as well, because uh, hats change in, during this time. Uh, so you've got your field service cap, which you would wear behind the lines, but then you also have your steel helmet, which you would be wearing on the front line in the trenches. And is there any writing about this kind of thing? You know, let all those diaries that people were writing, all those letters home, did they ever complain about their old tunic, you know, getting drenched in water, getting bitten through by rats or anything like that? Yeah, again, in our archive, there are probably countless letters talking about the different aspects of serving in the First World War, it being in the trenches, fighting on the front line, and, and the different parts of uh, uniform that didn't always perform well, or, I don't know, you know, writing home for socks or a balaclava or uh, wanting them to knit things for them. After a brief post-war boom, Britain faced serious economic woes in the 1920s. Under the recommendation of Sir Eric Geddes in what became known as the Geddes Axe, public spending was severely reduced. Heavy defence cuts were imposed and the government introduced the 10-year rule, stating that Britain would not enter conflict for at least a decade. But by the 1930s, Hitler's Nazi party became increasingly aggressive and expansionist, and within 20 years of the Treaty of Versailles, Britain prepared herself to fight once again. So here we have an example of battle dress, it's a battle dress blouse. Uh, this is introduced in 1938, so a little while after the end of the First World War. Carrying on with that practicality trend, high waist, you've still got pockets. The material that's used on this is also really interesting um, because uh, in 1940, obviously once the war is underway, uh, we get an austerity pattern where they cut back on the amount of material that's being used. So you lose this extra layer here so the buttons are visible and you lose the pleats on the pockets as well and I think that really ties into the socio-economic circumstances at the time. And do we know if they were a success? They last for quite a while up to uh, the 1960s which is when kind of what we properly think of today as camouflage comes in. And so this moves us to this one here? It does yeah so this is DPM which is disruptive pattern material a uh, huge jump from battle dress to this. Um, so DPM comes in in the 1960s uh, with the end of national service conscription in around 1961. Uh, the army is looking for a new uniform uh, and they use uh, the clothing, uh, the combat clothing from the Korean War as a basis to develop a new kind of uniform. Um, and this is where this comes in. Um, this one actually dates to 1980, so 20 years after it's uh, it's come into wear, um, but there are also different types of camouflage as well. Um, so you have woodland and then desert, um, so that you can blend in, in 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 these different places that you find yourself in. Yeah, so this is pretty similar to today's uniform, mm. which is only this step forward. So yes. what is this different kind of pattern they've gone for here? So this is MTP, uh, multi-terrain pattern. Uh, so this comes in in 2010. So. Uh, so just over 10 years old now actually. 
as the name would suggest, it enables you to fight and be active in different types of terrain. So you can see that the colour has changed and the idea is that um, when men were fighting in Afghanistan, this would um, help you whether you uh, were fighting in an urban setting or in fields and that you could move seamlessly between kind of desert, mountains and kind of wooded areas. Um, and I can so see it's the first uniform that's got Velcro. Yes, it has Velcro. I'm surprised almost they have Velcro because that must be, if you're being dead quiet, you know, <laughs> that's a, one of the most noisy things, isn't it? Loud noise, it? Lifting off it? Of Velcro. Women have always played a part in the British Army. During the English Civil War, so many women disguised themselves as soldiers that King Charles I issued a proclamation to stop them. There were even women's corpses found on the battlefield of Waterloo. But it wasn't until the 20th century that women's positions were formally established. You see the introduction of, uh, I suppose, uh, nursing services uh, at the turn of the, uh, the 20th century. So there is uh, Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service, which begins in 1902. And then, of course, we've got the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, which starts in 1909. Um, but interesting, uniform-wise for them, for the Fanny, they had to uh, provide their own uniforms. Um, so it wasn't a case of being provided like with the men, but they are, I suppose, still separate to the army. But when we get to the First World War, that changes. And here we have a Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in the overall dress, which they were, uh, they were issued with. They could also have kind of tunics and skirts as well. But I think the main thing about this with women's uniforms is it's very much of its time, you're in a skirt or a dress. So who was wearing this kind of uniform? What sort of work were they doing? So it was women that were joining the WAC to do war-related tasks that men were no longer there to be able to do. So kind of, you know, postal and transport and that kind of, uh, okay. That kind of job. Okay, um, and then we're yeah. moving on to this jacket. Yeah, so too. then we jump forward to the Second World War. Um, so uh, this jacket was actually worn by Mary Churchill who was in the uh, Auxiliary Territorial Service. It's a battle dress blouse, obviously very, very similar to the men's. There would still be a skirt that would be worn with this. Um, but, uh, but we see, and with this as well in the colour, there's a lot of similarity to men's uniforms. Um, but uh, I think it was only motorcyclists or people fulfilling that role that would actually be able to wear breeches um, for, uh, for tasks they were doing, performing. Yeah, well, it's interesting that they've, of course, got this khaki camouflage kind of style mm. but they're they're in the UK just yes. doing kind of civilian jobs yeah very much imitating the men's but yeah obviously fulfilling very very different roles like women aren't obviously allowed to uh, to fight so the Women's Royal Army Corps are established in 1941 um, but this one actually dates to 1990 um, but the Women's Royal Army Corps it's the the first time women are kind of officially part of the British Army and not an emergency uh, corps unit raised uh, yeah, during an emergency. And it's interesting they've got a this, this kind of teal colour. Yeah, <laughs> they do change in colour ever so slightly. Still in skirts as well. Um, but what we have, we can see uh, these on the lapels here um, denote army staff. And again, that's another thing that replicates men's uh, service and their uniforms um, and, and the epaulets and, and things here. And so during this time, the 90s, is that when military uniform is the same for women and men at this wow. point? Wow, so in 1992 the Women's Royal Army Corps had disbanded and men's and women's services emerged so then everybody starts wearing the same thing. Women would wear uh, camouflage if they were out um, uh, on service alongside men but yeah there was still this differentiation so yeah 1992 is uh, a really key point when where both services come together. Um, and yeah, and then everybody is wearing the same thing. Um, but it's also interesting to note that it was only in 2015 that David Cameron announced that kind of frontline uh, close combat roles would be open to women by 2016. So and I think at Sandhurst at the Pass Out Parade, the women still wear skirts. Mm. So there is that, you know, <laughs> there's that stick with tradition, I suppose. Yeah, very much so. It, there's a lot of um, and really lovely tradition as well that carries through throughout uniform in the army in, in loads of different ways.
Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.